So um, we're going to try to kind of map out a few questions, right? That are um, to kind of see how we fit on the on the spectrum. And um, the first one, I think, that is really remarkable. But actually, across all the presentations, there are some words that keep that keep coming back, and um, I've kind of like highlighted them. And what, one of the keywords there is uh, differentiation, heterogeneity, and complexity. Like these words keep coming back. So the, despite some of the kind of claims that, um, you know, some of the claims around like the discrete or some of the, the claims, for example, that like uh, Casey's work is doing, it kind of, when there's a kind of an evaluation about the contributed value, it kind of keeps going, coming back to, to this kind of, um, yeah, to this kind of three terms, right? In the end, you're kind of saying like, oh yeah, we now have this pattern that contributes to like more heterogeneity or more complexity, or we're able to kind of introduce more complexity and more heterogeneity. So then my kind of question is, is there really, like, isn't that still then the same experiment as like 30 years ago? Like, where is actually the kind of, um, like, is that where we are actually still going for? Is this how we judge the work? Is it all about kind of introducing more complexity? And then should we evaluate that kind of all these strategies or tactics in terms of like how much complexity they can deliver? Like, why is this term so important uh, today? And I would com combine with complexity, so it's complexity, differentiation, and heterogeneity are the three words that in all presentations were used to kind of um, say why this strategy is valuable. So we can kind of go one by one, I think. Sure. I mean, I think uh, for me at least, it's like reframing the word, the word heterogeneity, for example. And I also try to be quite specific in that I always frame it in a social sense, um, not necessarily in a like sense that has to do with purely patterns or tectonics. And so if that's, for me, it's a reframing. I mean, I think the, the term obviously can be traced back to the first generation of digital design because this notion of variability allowed this idea of um, heterogeneity and patterns. But I think for me it's important to reframe it in a, in, towards this idea of inclusivity. And heterogeneity is something that is embedded in an inclusive social framework. Um, I think in my work it's more kind of related to uh, maybe the materiality and like our new kind of uh, ways of um, constructing these new architectures that allow for uh, like new levels of like complexity or like different uh, kind of levels of these uh, kind of uh, environments like through like new uh, processes in design or new like ways of recombining uh, systems or kind of uh, yeah, new ways of, of building them up and to create kind of new um, like layers of uh, complexity in these material systems and like then see what, what that can uh, but the, I, I, I think the question is why is that so important? Like, why do you use complexity as a measure of the work? Because, like, you were presenting all your research about, yep. you know, distributed robots yep. going off-site, yep. mm -hmm. and the, the validator is for you is complexity. Like, you're validating it in the end by saying, through doing this method, we can introduce mm -hmm. more variability, mm -hmm. degrees of like material gradients of materiality and complexity. But why why is that the validator? I, I feel for like the that's work? where like maybe the um, that's like a, a very deep, like why like also like because our built environment is kind of very complex and not very like uh, kind of and in order to like I think meet challenges for the built environment you need to be able to create systems that can adapt and that can differentiate because like uh, but that's not that's not like formal complexity right that's like a complexity of a of a, an environment but that doesn't mean that it's for, that formal complexity delivers these challenges or. Um, no, I mean, but I feel like that, like formal or like material complexity, can kind of deliver those challenges. Because the the what I find fascinating, and we'll, we'll keep going yeah. with it, but just to kind of clarify why I think these questions are very important. Mm -hmm. Like, if you look at the references that mm -hmm. actually in our three yeah. presentations were shown by uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms, for example, yeah. they don't care about heterogeneity or complexity, right? So they are just stacking serialized elements, they're not differentiated, they're stacked into grids, they perform, and they, they do everything that you're saying, right? They act in complex, difficult situations, extraterrestrial, mm -hmm. you know, mountains, etc. Yeah. So the thing what we seem to be adding as architects yeah. when we take that work into yeah. architecture is that we add that kind of narrative of complexity 
in there. And the, the question is why is that? Why is that? Because uh, I think we need to have these layers of complexity from to move from something like the the, the uh, center for bits and atoms work that is like made for like inside like space uh, outer space like assembly or like very kind of. Uh, on a very limited lab scale, if you want to move this to a building scale, and if you want to use kind of uh, not only like what they use, which are like uh, carbon fiber uh, uh, kind of cubes that they prefabricate and they're like super difficult or like to fabricate and they're kind of highly like custom. But if you want to kind of introduce like new materials, you kind of need to kind of cater. Uh, like you need to, to adjust. Because, like, um, and that maybe brings it back a bit to Molly, and then we can jump there. But I mean, like, to to for this debate, or like to make it clear, there is no one saying that when you do distributed robots, yeah. that you need to differentiate material. You could also say, like, the point is just to automate the process. And then yeah. we go to like the examples Molly was showing of Catera, mm -hmm. but don't give a damn about differentiating. Mm -hmm. no, no. You know, we saw the image with like. Although, although they make a claim to be able to, which is quite yeah. Funny. But so, so the question is then, and I want to now jump to Casey, and then, then we go through. But so, I mean, then in the work of Casey, like the reason why you kind of frame that all through idiosyncrasy, like through basically that you're just doing this as a designer, right? Like you're really interested in the kind of the, the aesthetic effects and the kind of exploration of like the, you call it your dirty laundry, like the kind of like, like aesthetics, and then I guess like your aesthetics are interested in um, kind of a high degrees of heterogeneity and some kind of like density or saturation of the image. Like, and that's so there is no kind of, in a way, societal or technical reason for complexity, but it's just because you like I, density and saturation. I disagree a okay. little bit. I mean, actually, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I use complexity. Uh, there was a, a period in my youth when we were all gunslinging to see how many polygons we could create um, where that mattered to me. Complexity as a pursuit is not that interesting. Or it's, it's, not like a, it's not the criteria that I'm evaluating the work at. It's more that as a, a kind of received uh, principle um, in, in terms of the kind of current context. And um, I, I mean, maybe things are different here, but you know, at least um, where I live, uh, the kind of upcoming generations are all like kind of are completely um, raised on having, you know, six screens running simultaneously. I think the way they navigate space, inhabit space, understand aesthetics is very different than, than um, maybe more traditionally trained designers do. Uh, so for me, it's not so much that I'm like aiming for complexity. It's that there are certain inherent complexities in contemporary culture that I'm looking to try to find um, where there's a disciplinary project within, because I think the kind of discipline itself um, I, I think there's a, well, again, maybe this is just from the point of view where I'm coming from um, back in LA, but there's a certain inward refocusing amongst a certain generation that's maybe ignoring this kind of pluralistic explosion that's happening in the world. So I, I guess I'm looking to try to figure out like what the architecture is that is responding to that contemporary context and um, by kind of mining the underlying algorithms and stacks within it. And I, you know, we can say like, yeah, Katera claims they're differentiating, but they're not really. Um, but yeah, so do all of us. Like, I mean, we were just talking before about kind of, you know, this kind of project that you and I were uh, kind of quixotically tilting at, it's way too big for either of our practices. And it's like, yeah, when you scaled up your stuff, it didn't work anymore because it's just massively repetitive and homogenous, right? Like the differentiation has been always this claim within the kind of, the, from the parametric to the multi-agent stuff to the neural net stuff, that it is, it's like an inherent value in these things. And you can, you can with a kind of, really kind of narcissism of small differences, fine, minute differences in things. But qualitatively, if you showed two different agent growths to the same people, they would look exactly the same. Or two different, like, um, I, I, w I would wager, you know, like the, the thing that you show, that you saw some of, like, the Zaha stuff, UN Studio stuff, Lisa, like all these guys, all, like the stuff I was doing at Graph when I was a kid, even the stuff that the department store down Roy can no one would actually see any kind of differentiation in them. They're like, oh, these are all the same. Mm -hmm. right? And then that brings maybe to go to Jürgen, like, so we're using this term complexity. And so on the one hand, it's used to, as a kind of a word to just say, if there's a lot of pixels, a lot of elements, a lot of, you know, crazy stuff going on the screen, we give that this term complexity. But like, at what point would you actually call architecture itself a complex product? Because there is a lot of, and you were using this kind of the buzzwords that I guess we're all educated, which is like, emergence, complexity, adaptability, like they're, they're the kind of the typical words, right? 
But in the end, like, I mean, there are quite precise definitions to argue why a system would be complex or not. Like, you know, like, like complexity is, is, is something that you can, uh, it's, it's a science, you can find it in, in, in it's related to systems, etc. But at, at what point could you actually say that a physical building is more complex or less complex? And not, and not in terms of like just having, you know, more parts or more differentiated spaces or more heterogeneity. But like the complexity, for example, could we think about buildings being complex more in the way how they are produced or negotiated or procured, even though they may be spatially, you know, visually are not complex. So I'm, I'm interested to figure out when you are using the term complexity <coughs> in the work of like UN Studio, what does that actually refer to? Like what is complex in that architecture? Um, I mean, wh where we came from and, and also kind of the reason why I started at UN Studio was that kind of attractiveness of that complexity because at that time it was for me something that is that is um, yeah it was to me very very appealing so um, they, I saw you in city back then as kind of in the forefront of kind of experimenting with, with that complexity in order to uh, discover new typologies and new new ways of how you could shape architecture so it's literally coming down to shape but uh, I have to say that this we also kind of passed that time uh, in, in, in our practice, uh, I mean, the, the project I've been showing is, is fairly, um, yeah, as I said, it's, it's long processes. And you also re refer to these processes. These processes, in my understanding, they, they gained a lot of complexity. So it's not so much anymore on like really formal complexity yeah. that is also wished by clients and by all the stakeholders. It's rather the, the opposite. So we, we, we have a certain reputation that we now need to deal with in, in terms of formal complexity. So we, we try to actually kind of row a little bit back from that and, and kind of zoom out onto the bigger picture. Um, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, like I said, for the complexity, for the processes, but also production. Production is, is, is key. So we, we heard there's still a slap, there's a slap, there's a slap. Um, this is the kind of the Walkman against the iPhone. How do, we, how do we kind of connect these two things, like the new ideas with the old technology? And, um, and I think this is, this is where we also try to challenge it, it a lot and where we try to innovate. Um, when we, for example, we built that thing in Arnhem, the big twist, um, we needed to talk to actually shipbuilders who can bend steel in different directions and assemble it as plates rather than pouring it up from concrete. Um, mm -hmm. So, but this is, this is really the, let's say the journey and, and the, the uh, endeavor you, you need to do in order to but I, I would make a kind of a difference there. I mean, like, isn't that just um, you're more describing that to do the work that it's difficult, right? Like the, to build Arnhem is difficult. To build Hangzhou in, in China, the towers, is difficult. But is it because it's difficult that the architecture is complex? Or where exactly is this architecture complex? How would you define complexity in these buildings? Is it the programmatic complexity or is it just a fact that it's difficult to build these things I think I think it's uh, it's actually on all levels like like the demand for for these kind of buildings is is certainly there I mean there's a big difference of course between Asia and Europe um, uh, when, when you when you think in terms of scale um, so so I believe that um, yeah, it, it goes through many layers uh, throughout. And of course, uh, the, 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 there's kind of a disconnect between like what, what you can actually achieve in the physical world, in the physical realm, how if you, once you go on site, and with the idea you have up front. So this connection in between, this is where, where, where we try to kind of fill in. Because if you have that idea and you, you cannot connect it to whatever industry or, or manufacturer to, to build it, you need to go the extra mile in order to develop a system or, or a process that, that really enables you to follow your initial idea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like that also like I would kind of, you know, for example, in the case of Catera, which is this like prefabricated um, <coughs> company, like startup that has a huge amount of funding and it's basically chunking out, you know, pretty standardized just the houses, right? But what these guys, where these guys, unlike architects, where they see complexity is actually in the, in the logistics. Like they actually, just like any other tech company, except architects, like architects see complexity in the image, <coughs> but other, the actual tech industry sees complexity in the process, right, in the chain of logistics. So what Katera is doing is setting up a complex system of negotiating where material is coming from, how they cut it, at what point they deliver it, 
and it's 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 complexity in logistics, but not in the not in the formal outputs, which is in a way a little bit a challenge, right? Because I think still, like as architects, we always um, kind of yeah, ar like argue through the work that we we're able to do difficult things. Like that seems to be a bit of the game, right? Like oh, we can we can use technology to do these difficult things. Whereas in other industries, it seems that it's immediately more about other questions, right? Like like ar like architects have this kind of weird. Um, weird way to judge whether the work is, is valid if you use a computer and it's like can we do the work like the work is good if we could not do it without a computer like that's how we judge right like we're like this work is great because without a computer i would not be able to do that work with which is also like it's not that difficult to do something with a computer that you cannot do without a computer right i mean i can print a lot of numbers very fast that i cannot do without a computer and I feel like that is still something that is kind of governing a lot of work, is that this kind of the benchmark to judge it is like, well, if it's something that seems impossible to do by hand, it's kind of good. Whereas on the other hand, like if you look at what Katera is doing, like they don't care about that, right? I mean, all of their buildings, you could imagine, you could draw them, right? You could imagine them, you could build them by hand. But the whole intelligence is in the complexity of actually the production chain there. And I, and I think that's, that, that's like a very kind of, scary moment as architects, right? Because our only thing that, like, at least in this morning session that we present that we have seems to be, well, we can do difficult things. And those guys are like, we don't want to do difficult things. We're just going to do, you know, like, we, we, we're just going to change the way that things are produced. But, um, but don't you think that there is also, like, a crazy amount of opportunity there, like, also for architects to then kind of uh, maybe jump on the ship and kind of be able to then not only author like or create buildings that you you don't that, like that have not this distinct that difference between the people who build it and the actual building that is being produced but having like being able to author everything from like uh, the material sourcing to the actual building and creating buildings that are kind of maybe not only working as like uh, kind of final products but as like systems and as like yeah. complex systems that kind of scale from start to finish yeah absolutely but yeah. That, like like that's what these guys are doing yeah but i mean and that's a that, shift of like thinking of just formal complexity to thinking about complexity residing yes but then the, i mean uh, uh, but i would imagine that or i hope that it's also an opportunity for architects to kind of uh, jump on board and kind of make more out of that than kind of just the standardized forms okay yeah. yes mm -hmm. i mean like that's a, more or less what I'm arguing for, yeah. right? But I'm not arguing for it through um, like a aesthetic complexity mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. even really like um, tectonic complexity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. No, you are not. And like, like that brings back also, I think, a really big debate between, because I'm trying to construct this spectrum where people are. Oh, yeah. So, and I, I feel like, uh, Casey, and you're actually on a polar, kind of a polar spectrum. Because like yeah 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 because like like Casey is all about like idiosyncratic like yeah. authorship, and you like what Molly what what is actually your position on authorship like where is authorship in in your I mean, project even to like where, where even, do you see even it even to like... acknowledge that authorship is huh? even to acknowledge that authorship uh -huh. is like a term that's valid today I think is like dangerous okay you know like I think like authorship insinuates this idea of like the singular and I would argue that there's this. They're underlying that is the notion of plurality, and if we are thinking about complexity, or if we're thinking about simplicity, or if we're thinking about the, all of the kind of logistics of how we create architecture today, we can't use this term, the author. So mm. for me, it's... I feel like we have a polar spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that you're kind of, uh, in the way you're, you're posing the, the problem, you're, you're kind of misaligning like what we're doing here. Uh, I, I don't think that it's so much that, like again, like my interest is not uh, a pursuit of doing things in really difficult ways. Um, my interest is in finding the other, right? Um, and I don't think it's any different than um, things that happen in kind of product design or um, fine arts or music production. Like you know, like you're, you're conflating uh, the kind of businesses of production with businesses that are trying to produce the kind of find like in, like novel forms of cultural production, right? Mm -hmm. And ways of engaging culture in, in a new way. It's like no different than when the, you know the modernists like maybe there's less computers involved, but that was you know uh, they had to invent an entire way of teaching humans how to design architecture that was different than the last uh, six, 80 years, right? In order to achieve that work, right? That's pretty difficult. But it, it's now the architecture that they were doing then, that kind of other, 
that find that that relevant thing is the stuff that Katera is doing now, right? Like the types of a lot of the Katera's work is because um, they, they kind of they purchased they literally purchased five kind of new modern architecture firms in San Francisco is the byproduct of that. So they're a production company, but they are benefiting from that project that you are being suspicious of right now that was done in the 20s. So I think what we're what, like our role in this particular um, kind of paradigm is kind of maybe probably I think shorter generations. I think we saw a much faster from the kind of 90s paperless studios to the construction of kind of UN studio Zaha's um, stuff. Um, you know, like th th that's what we're doing here is we're looking for that other. Huh. And so whether it's difficult to do, I think difficulty has to do with, or, or difficulty I think is inherently necessary to force you to think in ways that you're not used to. Um, and so rather, and I think, I, I actually also agree that authorship is less important, but I, I do think like as authorship, this kind of singular authorship is maybe less relevant of a model, my interest is in, okay, but so then where does the idiosync idiosyncrasy or the kind of other come from then? Because in the past it has come from singular crazy dudes being like, no, no, this is the way a building needs yeah. to look like, right? <laughs> um, and, the, and so like things like Lev Manovich is kind of really deep dive on the kind of differences in selfies that, uh, that occur between like Sao Paulo and Tokyo, these kind of emergent micro differences. I think that's mm -hmm. a potentially interesting kind of cumulative um, production of other, right? That, that would be where I, I would situate that. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe last question before we kind of round this up to the, or did, did you want to comment on this? No, no. Yeah. Maybe like a last question because so there is this kind of, um, you know, this notion of automation that has been debated, the question of uh, platforms. You're talking a lot about Katera and WeWork. Uh, UN Studio started a startup now as well, which seems to kind of want to cater also to those tech companies. So the, the question here is also a little bit like, for example, like both in Molly's and, and Casey's work, like how do you actually compete with those platforms? Because we know like from the external checks book, for example, is that these platforms are just, you know, per definition, like incompetible, right? Yeah. Because they're, they're, the whole thing they do is try to scale so quickly with so much kind of virtual money that they are there before you and you cannot like compete with them. Like the, the moment like, in a way, the kind of the dream that is somehow in this first panel is kind of like all these beautiful ideas. If we put that together, you know, could we actually, you know, scale that to make that actually like a platform rather than just catering to those upcoming industries? So, like, the, 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 the question is a little bit like, what is actually your economic tactic in respect to those um, to those platforms? I mean, I, I might be accused of being a good German here, but you, you heard who sponsored my project, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not competing. I'm <laughs> Just playing ball. <laughs> you're, you're, you're yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, like, I think we are also. We, we are also. Complicit. Like, I mean, we started a, a consultancy specifically to be complicit in those processes. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's from the inside out, right? It's not. It's not from the outside in. The outside in, you'll get stomped on. It's also not it, like the economic strategy, as we have discussed previously, is not this idea of the traditional startup. And I think like this is a really important thing that takes um, VC investment, like something like Katera, which eats up this kind of, um, uh, uh, eats up competition, you know? And so I think this, uh, a different model um, uh, for like these kinds of practices is important than falling into the sort of tech model. Yeah, I, I had said that before, for, for us it's really important to kind of f fill the gap, to come from the one end as being an architect, as kind of looking at this as a, so uh, profession in that sense, to say the, the 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 master architect who kind of has this visionary idea about the building, uh, and then you have at the other end you have you have technology companies or builders or whatsoever. Um, to to fill in that gap, uh, you, you need to of course also from an economic standpoint kind of broaden your your standpoint, and you need to be able to to uh, respond. And, and even also, yeah, I mean, we also try to help with consultancy. We try to share our experience. As we uh, uh, see ourselves as that we have accumulated a lot of knowledge over the past uh, 30 years, um, there's a lot we can share, a lot we can exchange and talk about. And, and I think this is where, where we kind of see our value is, is this exchange and, and, and exactly what we do here yeah. at this point. Yeah. Cool. Um, Let's maybe open it up to the audience, and then um, if there is any questions from the audience, otherwise we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Are there any any comments? Yeah, Jose. 
Um, thanks. I wanted to like twist the question a little bit. I mean, it's similar to the first one regarding complexity, but I started wondering if you put the word luxury in branding, right? Or can, can actually a luxury brand become a critical project of architecture? Because Casey, you, you spoke about what is critical for the discipline. Um, so I guess when we address complexity, um, you could start thinking, well, maybe there's a branding behind as well. And I think that we're all kind of falling into that problem. So I'm questioning, can really luxury, like a luxury brand in architecture or a boutique kind of practice become a critical project? I mean, no. It depends, like, from my kind of, like, political and ethical stance, no. Uh, but it, I think that that's, like, a generational difference, right? Um, a, a really, like, stark generational difference, actually where we have this idea of sort of like the boutique or bespoke practice, which was like the fundamental kind of like um, group of practices in the 90s and early 2000s, which have become these sort of bespoke luxury brands and operating on huge amount, huge scales, right? But I think for me, um, as part of this slightly different generation, that question is like, it, it's impossible. And I don't think that we should be um, focusing our energy on this idea of um, luxury and bespoke, but actually if we want to be as effective or instrumental or operative as possible, be able to operate with much more diversity um, than those practices. I, I think it's more interesting, I, I'm actually not, I, I may be becoming like really suspicious of even if like a critical project is, is, um, is, is particularly valuable now the kind of ana the analytic of uh, the thing before so whether or not like a luxury brand can be critical or not i mean that would, you'd certainly would look in fashion to see if there are people attempting that model you know um but i think what's actually maybe more interesting is the kind of the production of a cultural product that has the massive relevancy and a larger impact on on humanity and that absolutely can come from a luxury brand like apple had a pretty big impact on the way that we talk to each other communicate with each other from a very expensive uh, phone basically right so I think if we start to look at it this way I don't think that there's anything kind of I think that you're looking for um, something underlying like some kind of underlying like um, inability of a luxury brand to contribute at that level and I, I think that's actually inaccurate I, I think that absolutely a luxury brand can have a, a massive cultural impact and I think that those types of productions are far more interesting than a kind of disciplinary critical project but the difference there between Apple and an architectural practice is the, the things that we're producing. And I think that makes it actually very di a different condition entirely when thinking about a critical project. I, I, I also think that, that you can, like, they can be used as like, incubators for uh, like, uh, new kind of projects like that. that they're kind of like, really <coughs> to, like, experiment because like, at like, places like Zaha, like, I mean, a lot of like, us also were like, working there at the like, UN studio. and like, all these kind of places that can be used kind of as incubators to kind of uh, have uh, also like smaller scale, maybe more research-based projects inside of this larger framework where you don't then like uh, in a university don't have like economic constraints, but can just like create things that maybe uh, don't necessarily in the first place need to have economic values. Like, I mean, for instance, like at Zaha, like Zaha Code, like which is kind of sponsored by the whole, uh, by, like, by the whole firm to kind of do its thing, but then kind of contributes in like a different way to the practice as a whole. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I, I don't want to like get in a super drawn out fight with Molly here because she'll win. <laughs> She's much smarter than me, but I actually don't think there's that big a difference. And I actually think our failing to um, uh, actually operate in that territory is why we're giving over agency to things like WeWork and, yeah, and Katera. Yeah. yeah, I think we kind of have to maybe start well, to I mean, adjust the way we think in order to not lose our entire profession to this other agency? I think it's more this, this, um, this question of where does, like, if we're thinking about that, where does consumerism lie in architecture versus where does it lie in, in product designs like Apple or whatever? And it's different when we think about buildings. Like, I think there's a fundamental difference between, like, the idea of the consumerist, like, buying a building than, like, the consumerist buying an iPhone. Although I agree with you that the mechanisms, That's us it. losing... We well, we work, I think, as it is... A, like, yeah, I mean, I think WeWork is one of those things that can fit into this idea of like the lean platform, for example, or the product platform. So 
but it's also about luxury it's and it's also luxury. yeah it's also about luxury it's yeah. yeah yeah i mean like the collective for example is like 100 quid a night or something like that like it's not accessible to like the everyday person stay yeah, like a month for like a month for example so yeah i but i think like there's this uh, different kind of attitude when you're thinking about it from like the everyday person or who doesn't have the ability to like commission a house or building or whatever that that there's a difference there for me like a fundamental difference there that changes the conversation yeah. I, w I would also agree that it's, um, that it's, for me, I also see it more as an incubator um, in that sense. I mean, if, you, if you look at the Apple campus, the Apple Loop, uh, pairing this with Fosters, um, what, what they did in this building is um, um, literally nuts, uh, kind of how they pushed, uh, pushed the envelope. Um, uh, but, I mean, talking to all the engineers, and we also work together with the same engineers involved in that project, is it also opened new new possibilities uh, for, for us as architects. So, um, yeah, there is a spark coming from uh, the collaboration with luxury, uh, or with, the, let's say, the wallet of these uh, luxury companies. Yeah, like, I mean, Mercedes-Benz Museum being, I mean, a crazy kind of, I think, very very valid cultural contribution that in a way came out of a collaboration with a, with a luxury brand, right? But I think that, that building is something that, you know, we had to try on scale one-to-one -one in a way, right? Yes, yes, so, yes. Uh, um, I mean, in terms of the typology, this was certainly uh, pushing it back then. But if you look at this luxury brand, they have a history of more than 100 years and kind of mm -hmm. the development. So there's a lot of kind of cultural aspects to that that they need to kind of take into consideration. And um, I mean, in the end, we, we, th that building was built on budget in time. So there, there was, uh, there's, a, there's a certain benefit working with these kind of companies because you have uh, <coughs> different, different possibilities. But I think yeah, what is like very different between like these uh, maybe like architecture companies and then uh, places like WeWork and uh, Google and so on is that like also like a different question of IP. Like they're, they're not, uh, like Apple doesn't like give back like they don't uh, publish like uh, research. Like they're, it's like a closed loop system where they draw, or people like we work, they draw everything in, but they don't necessarily like contribute like, I don't know, maybe like architecture practices or uh, like uh, research like uh, that is being done at the university through like kind of a broader agenda, but it's more kind of a, uh, a brain. Yeah, that's more or less remarks or are we in need of a coffee? Questions, anyone? Okay, then uh, we'll do. Um, you want to ask a question then? No? Uh, no? Okay. Uh, maybe. Okay, that's that's the last one. Then we do the then we do the break. I mean, it comes always like a, a bit the notion. Um, there's a difference in generations. Like there's a new generation. And um, I have a big a, a bit of problem when you make a binary segregation or when you say, hey, there's something old, there's something new. What's, what's actually nice is when, when I see like such a network, there's like a curiosity in a way in learning, which is in a way neutral, which is also disturbing that's neutral. But I mean, can we afford actually that we just say there's something completely radically different? So what is actually different in the kind of notion of space and so on? Because I, mean, I think also like departing from a feminist ecological background, Actually, we know that this kind of segregation or like the same what the modern ma uh, made, like skipping all histories and so on was also something where actually, uh, where, where it was later was a big mistake. So maybe like what, what is that, what's really, would you see yourself really different in the, in the context to, to something other? So what, what is, or like who is the other? Do you need that and, and why and so on? Beautiful know. question. <laughs> Does I, is, was that targeted to someone? Yeah. Yeah. Not especially, but more like, I, I mean, we talk about this, like, difference in generations. Mm -hmm. And so do, it, do it, we really it's, need... It's quite clear, I think, yeah. as, a, as a provocation. So. I mean, like, obviously, uh, I think it's, it's just a tool to make a statement that there has been a rad radical shift or change, right? And it's not that that generate, like, it's not that... Um, uh, it's a way to kind of like, as Jill said at the beginning, like kill the father, you know? And for me, like that father is like a, 
it goes back like 200 years, 300 years, That's right? Great. It's, it's a, a very, grandfather. it's a really old, <laughs> it's a great grandfather, you know, like it's, a, it's like um, a, a, a way of practicing, a, a way of conversing, a way of teaching that is, um, that can shift today because of the technologies that we have and the awareness that we have of um, global inequalities or whatever global issues. So for me, I don't know, like, yeah, that term is a, is problematic in some ways, but it's, it's not, it's just to actually make clear that there's a shift. Like it's to make like really obvious that there is one. And I don't think it's problematic to be able to do that because it's, it at least takes position away from something and towards something else. I think it's also like, um, I, I think it's a super valid question, Daniel, like to, to ask this, right? Is, is there this need for this dialectic and this like polarity? And I mean, I'm a strong believer in like dialectics and, and polarities because they very quickly flush out um, some kind of fundamental uh, issues. And I, I, I think also there is, like I, like, I think you need a certain criticality to understand that, like Molly's saying, that it's a tool and that it's not necessarily the truth. Like, it's a technique to, to, to progress, right, and to accelerate. And I think there is, and I mean, in, in a way, I think it's a super valid question to ask today because what we're seeing is that we're kind of entering a very black and white uh, world where there's a renewed radicality in many fronts. Like, there's a radicality, kind of a new populist radicality on both left and right, and there is a a new kind of, like, post-modernity is clearly over, right? We're facing a number of very clear, very black and white crises that we need to face or we cannot face. And somehow, like, that, that period of kind of the wooly, everything is kind of, you know, complex and fine-tuned and gray, that period is over, right? It, it, we're, we're at a time when, when a lot of, like, where the world is, again, becoming very black and white. And I think, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is good in any way, but I... On the other hand, I think as a tool, we need to acknowledge that. We also need to acknowledge that kind of climate. And I think your criticism is also true, that we need to, you know, kind of be aware of that polarity and that while on one hand it's very exciting, that on the other hand it's also could, could, could be quite dangerous and, and uh, you know, potentially brush over a lot of, of necessary gray zone, right? I mean, it's also I'm like, being very gray in my answer because. <laughs> well, it's also just like a mechanism to like to start to write history, I guess. Like to be able to say like there is this kind of different context in which we need in in which through we look back in time, and be able to let's say like move away some of the um, most prominent um, histories that have become part of our um, our like cognition as architects like that list that you had which is really funny the like are you Eisman or are you BRK or are you like whatever like I you know these kinds of things are um, are are now able to be kind of like put into a, into a wet into like a closet and kind of like the door can be locked for like an opportunity for another voice to come through and so I think that that is important as a, as a tool and as a mechanism. Cool. Cool. Um, we'll keep it there. So we are coming back here. I think at 